We are four days away from the beginning of Chinese New Year. This is the year of the monkey. So gong hei fa choi. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and a special thanks to Humanities Montana, our longtime friend at the Society. There should be some time for questions at the end of my remarks, and I hope you have some. Let's see, Let's see if I can walk and chew gum here. And remember, this is not a video game. Okay. I'd like you to meet my father, his brothers, sister, and some of their friends. That's my father, the snappy dresser, four people from the right. The children of Wang On Ki and Ruby Chin Li Wang were the second generation of their family to live in Helena. They were the children of immigrants, happy in their young lives, in one of Helena's oldest neighborhoods. Some of the friends shown here were born in China, but my father and his siblings were born right here on West Main Street. I love this picture, taken probably sometime in the 1930s, the late 1930s. They were having a very good day. Their lives weren't perfect, but if they wanted to marry someone who wasn't Chinese, they would need to leave Montana. If someone didn't want to hire them or rent an apartment to them just because they were Chinese, that could happen, and did, and it was legal. But for a generation before theirs, to be Chinese could have been more than difficult or unfair. It could have been dangerous. Sometimes Chinese people could live and die without even their names recorded in a cemetery index. You probably can't see this very well, but this is an actual section of the Helena Forestvale Cemetery record. It's kind of shocking after reading a list of names like Child and Chessman with ages, dates of death, and sometimes even the cause of death. And then to see a whole list of names categorized simply as Chinaman. Chinaman 1, Chinaman 2, Chinaman 18, and so on. Some of these men listed had been buried at the county poor farm and were reinterred in China Row at Forest Vale. After reading a long list of names, <laughs> Even with ages and cause of death, it's shocking to see this. These people lived and died here in anonymity. Before I start my stories, for my grandparents, for these people whose names I do not know, and all the forgotten Chinese pioneers, I'd like to thank Rowena, Ellen, Roberta, Todd, and all the Historical Society staff for the exhibit that remembers they were here. I will preface tonight's program with a bit of a disclaimer. While I have researched and endeavored to understand the historical events of the Chinese American experience, for a more scholarly approach to Chinese American history, you'll want to attend presentations by Ellen Baumler or read works by Robert Swartout, Mark Johnson, or Christopher Merritt. This is just my personal narrative of people I knew, people I heard stories about, and my own family memories. I am pleased to have this opportunity to share stories of real people, Chinese people, and some of the real lives that happened here in the heart of Helena. This image was given to me by the late Jean Bacchus. She actually gave me two pictures of Chinese men at the turn of the century. She asked if I knew them. My feelings were kind of hurt. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I knew I was anything at all, I knew I was Chinese. I knew this not because of my father and the relatives, but because of my Irish-German mother. She was de determined that we would embrace our heritage. She had accumulated a considerable archive of articles, books, and clippings. It was known in our family as the China suitcase, and we could be sure when we were assigned to report on another country, she would ask, has anyone taken China yet? As, as I've thought about my own life and the lives of the generations of people that populate my stories, particularly the Lee sisters, whom I'll talk about later, I see at once efforts to fit in, to assimilate, and be accepted, yet still remember origins and traditions. In my home, with only one parent speaking Chinese, we spoke only English. The daughters of my brothers, however, became fluent in Chinese, taking classes at university and traveling to China many times, 
But while they still honor some traditions, they are modern women and Americans first. All are directors in their companies, Sarah with Microsoft, Hannah with Boeing, and Chanda with Starbucks. Most of my life, I've lived within about six miles of where I grew up, where my father grew up, and where my grandfather, Wang On Ki, built his fine brick home and settled his new American Chinese family. Growing up in the 50s and 60s in a neighborhood largely mowed down by urban renewal in the early 70s, I didn't realize that Ch the Chinese people I knew, those that came to the memorable feasts my father hosted, and those elderly men who held court around the table in front of the ice cream freezer at the Wingxing Grocery, we were all that remained of hundreds of Chinese who once lived and worked in an area known as Helena's Chinatown. My first realization that there had been a large Chinese population in Helena came when I was enjoying my first job outside my family's restaurant. That was the summer I worked as a fill-in reporter slash copy girl for the independent record. Copy girl was a job title in the days when news type was set in hot lead. Maybe uh, Jane, Jean Bacchus was right about those turn of the century pictures. <laughs> But the type was set in hot lead, and there was an actual job for a person to take the typewritten news sheets from the newsroom to the back shop. Among other duties, I filed in a most interesting, dusty little room called the morgue. In the morgue, I discovered the city directories. And in those city directories, from the early 1900s through the 20s, I discovered dozens of Chinese names. I could hardly wait to get home and confront my mother, the renowned Chinese cheerleader, about this. Her emphasis had been on China the country, and I thought we'd pretty well covered that. This revelation that there'd been so many Chinese people here and now so few, this was new. She did know a little about it, as it turned out. My parents had married during a period when interracial marriage was illegal in Montana, and my parents had married in Seattle. A combination of factors reduced the Chinese population in Helena and other Montana communities. Some Chinese who came to America left families in China and immigrated with an intention to make money and return home. Many left Montana for places like San Francisco with a larger Chinese community, and some left because of discrimination, ostracism, and persecution. The Chinese Exclusion Act was a federal law signed by Chester Arthur in 1882. It followed revisions made in 1880 to the U.S.-China-Burlingame Treaty of 1868, revisions that allowed the United States to suspend Chinese immigration. The act was initially intended to last for 10 years, but was renewed in 1892 and made permanent in 1902. The Chinese Exclusion Act was the first law implemented to prevent a specific ethnic working group from immigrating to the United States. It was finally repealed in 1943. At the local level, the Chinese faced legislation such as the Alien Lands Act passed by many Western states in the early 1920s. Montana's law and others like it stated that individuals not eligible for citizenship could not own or lease land. By the time of my childhood, there were about a dozen Chinese families in the neighborhood and a few more scattered around Helena. According to federal census records, my grandfather, Wang On Ki, was born in California. According to his immigration document, he arrived in the United States, coming in through Canada in 1899, when he was about 35 years old. Because they were fearful of imprisonment, confiscation of property, or deportation, many Chinese people who wanted to remain in this country had safe explanations about their origins. Born in California was common. My own grandmother, Ruby Wong, told us she was born in Boston. Later, forgetting that story, when asked about her life, she said she was born in China, crossed the ocean to Canada, then came to Montana. The 1920 census lists her as born in Washington. <laughs> Much of Wang An Ki's life will remain a mystery. He worked as a merchant, as, and he ran, ran a truck farm out in the North Valley. At the end of his life, he was a janitor at the Union Bank. He was decades older than my grandmother, how much we don't really know. 
The immigration document says he was 35 in 1899. The 1920 census says he was born about 1870. His cemetery stone says he was born in 1859. That would make him 46, 52, or 65 when he died. <laughs> Ruby Wong lived in the present and wasn't really one to reminisce. One fascinating story she did tell was that her grandfather had been a ship captain who brought men from the villages across the Pacific Ocean to the Gold Mountain. Because so many of the men who left on his ship did not return home with the promised riches, the people in his own village hated him. They invited him to a banquet in his honor and poisoned him. My uncle said my grandmother was 14 or 15 when she married Ki. Ruby Lee Chin, or Ruby Chin Lee, was a paper bride. That is, the match was made by contract, probably with her husband-to-be seeing a picture of her and making the match. In a letter my Uncle George sent to me years ago, George wrote, quote, Grandfather made contact with a merchant in Seattle to try and find a bride in the 1900s. The merchant was by the name of Lee, and he brought over from China four daughters, of which one was to be Mama Wong, known at that time as Ruby Lee. He had to pay a dowry, I don't know how much, Grandma and her sisters were all given the surname of Lee. They were not really sisters. The Chinese merchant just named them after him. <laughs> Before Grandpa made a deal for Grandma, he bought the piece of property on West Main Street and hired a contractor by the name of Gebhardt to build the two-story brick building. You may remember it. The downstairs was a Chinese grocery store and lottery house. We lived upstairs, where I was born in 1917. At that time, Frank Joe's folks lived in two of the rooms upstairs, too. Frank's mom helped my mom to raise me, as she was only 17 or younger when she had me and did not know much about babies." End quote. A quick note about the Joe family illustrates the connections among the people in the old neighborhood across the generations. Mrs. Joe, shown here, was Margaret Joe, an English or Irish woman married to Yeho Jo, also known as Harold Jo. In Martha Cole's book, I Do, I Do, their marriage in February 1909 was headlined, White Woman Marries Chinaman, and the reporters mocked the language of both. Martha's book notes that one month later, that marriage would not have been legal, as the Montana legislature outlawed such marriages. This same Mrs. Joe, who boarded in my grand grandparents' home and helped my grandmother, was a great friend of the Lee sisters, who are featured later in this presentation. And Frank, the son of Harold and Margaret, handsome boy shown here, would grow up and own a refrigeration business across from my dad's restaurant and my own South Main home. The 1930 census said Ruby Wong was 35, her grave marker says she was born in 1899, so there's another slight discrepancy. Her first child was my Uncle George, followed by a baby who died shortly after birth, then my father, Freddie, in 1920, followed by Jack in 1922, and Rosie in 1924. Key died one month after Rosie was born. Ruby Wong was about 24 when her husband died. The Helena newspaper carried a brief paragraph about his death, referring to him as Ong Ki Wong, and said he was buried with full Chinese ceremony from his Main Street home. So Ruby Wong, all four feet nine of her, was on her own. She could not read or write either English or Chinese, and spoke very little English. She did have the house key owned, unusual for a Chinese in that time. She took in boarders, worked at restaurants on South Main, and stretched her pennies and made big plans. And she had help. When my grandfather became ill, he began making arrangements for his son from his first marriage in China to come to America. Wing Sam Wong assumed his father's job as a janitor at the Union Bank and helped Ruby provide for and parent her family. Uncle Wing was actually a little older than Ruby. He spent a lot of time with us when I was a child. Uncle Wing smoked constantly, and his hands were stained a dark gold. 
but his fingers were long and graceful, and his gestures were like those of a dancer. He had been an acrobat in China. He had high cheekbones in a slender face, and his hair was speckled with gray and quite curly. He seemed always to be annoyed with us, shaking his head and making sounds of disgust that didn't need translation. But when my brother Fred and I would head up State Street to May Butler School on a snowy day, there would be Uncle Wing's bright blue 53 Chevy waiting at the State Street corner. When Uncle Wing died in 1964, he left me that 53 Chevy, and I drove it happily for years. Ruby Wong moved to Missoula in 1941 and opened the Golden Pheasant. When she moved, she took almost nothing of her old life with her. She did well, had a lot of friends, and continued to work hard. With my Uncle Jack's family, she moved to a handsome house in Missoula's Paddy Canyon. One of her proud possessions was an enormous pink Cadillac with a giant fins and lots of chrome. The downside of this impressive vehicle was that she was so tiny she couldn't really see well when she drove in reverse. <laughs> so after a few fender benders, as she rolled down the driveway into a neighbor's car, the neighbor took care to keep his vehicle out of her way. <laughs> One spring when I was in college, I worked in my grandmother's restaurant with her. It was a hard shift to work, lunch through supper. She was by that time in her late 60s, and she was on her feet as much as I was. She did have a few tricks to keep the job manageable. Once, she had a large party of customers. After a couple of people made their selections, she held up her hand and said, it would be much better if you all had the same thing. <laughs> that settled, they all had the same thing. <laughs> Grandma learned to read well enough to get by, but her methods weren't without some bumps. One night when I was about eight and staying with her and my cousins, she came home with a tube of what she thought was toothpaste. Those were the days when shaving cream also came in tubes. <laughs> Grandma had brought home a tube of shaving cream with the same red and white packaging as toothpaste. We pointed out her mistake and laughed ourselves silly at the thought of Grandma foaming at the mouth. <laughs> now, that memory leaves me ashamed. I think of the girl she was, taken from her country to be married at first sight to a man old enough to be her father, then left to feed, clothe, and raise four children from one month to six years old in a country that wasn't always welcoming. She was clearly smart enough and tough enough and we could only hope some of that was genetic. Ruby Wong worked into her 80s, still convincing customers to order the same thing. <laughs> My father and his brothers all served in the military. This is dad in his Navy uniform during World War II. All of Key's sons owned restaurants. When my father returned to Montana, he worked at a number of jobs, saving money to eventually buy a longtime Helena restaurant on South Main called the OK Cafe. Sadly, shortly after he opened, a fire burned the place to the ground. Even the shelves burned, breaking the new dishes. He had little insurance, and it was years before he was able to rebuild. The rebuilt OK was where my siblings and I spent most of our young childhood, living in an apartment attached to the cafe. Eventually, my folks purchased Yat Sun, one of the oldest Chinese restaurants in Helena, north of the OK, but in the same block. Here, my sister and I joined Charlie and Flora Wong's kids and Sammy Ching's kids for a photo op in front of the Wing Shing Grocery across the street from the OK and my home. Finally, I would like to share with you my most recent obsession with what was probably one of the earliest settled Chinese families in Helena. When I was in my teens, I received an interesting box of vintage clothes from a woman named Maybelle Peronto. The clothes were from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. They belonged to Maybelle's sisters, women I came to think of as the fabulous Lee sisters. When the box came, my mother described the sisters as Chinese women trying hard to pass for white. She said they powdered their faces with rice powder and dressed in very cosmopolitan style. Those clothes were unlike anything my peers were wearing, and I loved them. I brought this one out of storage to share with you tonight. This was in the box. It looked much better on me when I was 19. 
From my mother's description, I thought those Lee sisters must have been, must have been quite the wild characters, unlike Maybell, who was pleasant and quiet. Actually, Maybell was an adopted daughter probably a cousin of the much older Lee sisters. And the little I know of her story is at once sweet and sad. Her parents left Maybell and her brother with the Lee family in Helena when Maybell was a toddler. After they settled themselves in California, they returned but took only the boy home with them. So Maybell was adopted by the Lees, by then a family of women. After the clothes were mostly outgrown and forgotten, a few decades passed before I thought about the Lees again. Then Maybell's widower, Vern Peranto, began to sell us items from the estate. More time passed. Then about eight months ago, I acquired these great images. Here is the captivating image of a mother in mourning black surrounded by four beautiful daughters in Edwardian white. I was curious about the family in the photo. I went to the Forest Vale Cemetery website and found names for three of the sisters. I wasn't sure which name belonged to which girl in the photograph, and what about the fourth sister? Thus began an obsessive journey. Sam Fong Lee, the patriarch of the family, was born around 1850 in China. The Helena City Directory of 1895 shows that Fong Sam Lee was at 14 and a half West State Street. Census records show he was engaged in real estate. Indeed, he owned a stately brick building built about 1885 at 14 West State. With a storefront on the main level and rooms on the second level, his name was eventually Americanized to, to Sam Fong Lee he died in 1908 of stomach cancer, according to Forest Vale records. His burial was initially in the section called China Row, that section of the cemetery which segregated the Chinese in death as they were in life in that period. As time changed, his remains were moved to the Mountain View section of the cemetery where the rest of his family is buried. According to census records, Sam and his wife married in 1891. This is Helen Lee in front of the State Street place. He was 41. His wife, Helen Yi, was about 28 years younger, born in 1878 or 1880, with records showing she was born in California. She lived a long life, 83 at the time of her death in 1963. Census takers had some differences in recording the ages of the Lees, and indeed they seemed unsure of their own ages. So these are, are approximate dates. Boxes of Lee family snapshots and cabinet, cabinet cards yielded lots of intriguing images, but no real information. They didn't write notes on the back of most of their photos, so no clues. One of the sisters seemed to have more photographs than the others. On the back of one small snapshot of a tall man towering over a small, uncomfortable-looking woman, there was a scribbled pencil note. It looked like Macy and Ernie. I have to say, when confronted with a mystery, the resources here are an excellent place to find clues. Off to the Historical Society Research Center and my old friends, the city directories. There, I learned the mystery name wasn't Macy, it was Mamie but she disappeared from Helena City Directories after 1928. I finally had to surrender and sign up for Ancestry. <laughs> now, with access to more old records, I found Mamie had married Ernest Ekstrand in 1928 in Clayton, Missouri. He was a Swedish man, about seven years older than Mamie. I mentioned that Mamie had a lot of photographs. These are a few of them. And in fairness to Mamie, those headdresses and such were props in the photo studio <laughs> that they, they used for snapshots at that time. The other Lee sisters, Lillian, the eldest, was born in 1893, Jenny in 1895, then Mamie in 1897, and Ruby, not to be confused with my grandmother, in 1902. They were all born in Helena, Maybell was born in 1920. With a new last name to follow, I found Mamie back in Helena again as Mamie Ekstrand from 1931 to 1933. 
Then she moved to Minneapolis from the mid-30s to 1942, working as a typist. In 1948, she returned to Helena again and finally filed for divorce from Ernest Ekstrand, although she probably only lived with him for a short time. The legal notice cited desertion and extreme neglect. Mamie traveled the farthest, was the most independent, and stayed away the longest. In the end, she too came home. Mamie Lee Ekstrand died in 1956 on a visit home to Helena from Minneapolis and is buried with her family in Forest Vale. Like my grandmother, Helen Lee lived more years without her husband than with him and raised five young children on her own. Her income was mainly from the Chinese who boarded or ran a store in the big house at 14 West State across from the city hall and fire station. And this image shows some of the city firemen right in front of the Lee building. And I appreciate getting this image from Sean Logan, who recently retired from the fire department. For the fabulous daughters of Helen and Sam, they were smart, ambitious, and resourceful. Ruby graduated from Helena High in 1990, at the time using the last name Fong. Mamie and Jenny graduated from Helena Business College. A news article in the Fallon County Times in Baker challenged an earlier announcement from Cincinnati. It seems that Cincinnati claimed to have the only Chinese typist in the United States. The Montana Papers headline proclaimed, Helena has two Chinese stenos. <laughs> the article noted that another sister was a photographer and still another a bookkeeper. By 1920, all of the family were using the Lee surname. Ruby was working for the firm, firm A.A. Growrood and Thomas Topping. The paper quotes Growrood as saying about Ruby, I am going to make her the best law stenographer in the state. Lillian, the photographer, took lots of photos. Many of them have Helena landmarks as backdrops, and I have to think she had a sense of humor. Here are a few of her images. These are a couple of Helena cabbies in front of the Broadwater Natatorium. This is the Lee family cat in their backyard on State Street. <laughs> Apparently they didn't need a watchdog. <laughs> this is a man with shoes. <laughs> and these are two little cowboys. Two of the Lee sisters tried marriages but it didn't work out for either of them. When Lillian married in 1914 to Toy Dawn, who owned a noodle parlor on State Street, the theme of assimilating and adopting the cultural rituals of the majority race was reflected in the event. The Helena newspaper reported the wedding was 100% American, right down to the clothes worn by the bride and the groom, and even the bride's sister. The wedding was small. One of the witnesses was A.J. Daddy Reeves, who was a well-known, beloved figure on Main Street for decades, uh, particularly among children. The honor attendant was Margaret Joe, whom I mentioned earlier. By the time of the 1920 census, Lillian described herself as divorced, had resumed the Lee name, was back at work and working at Parch and Drug as a photographer. Life went on for the Lee girls, now women, on State Street. In 1921, the Pittsburgh Press featured a human interest story on the Lee sisters. A big fan featured four oval portraits. The headline proclaimed, quote, lives of ease do not appeal to them. The, articles, the article read, as the four daughters of Lee Sam Fong, a rich Chinese merchant in Helena, Montana, neared young womanhood, Lee began to arrange for them lives of traditional Eastern ease but the daughters had ideas of their own. We're Americans, they said, and straight away they set out to support themselves. Jenny and Ruby are stenographers, Lillian is a photographer, and Mamie is a bookkeeper. Just as an aside, I'm not sure when young, and young womanhood began to approach, because when Sam Fong Lee died, Jenny was two years old, and Ruby was an infant. <laughs> <laughs> but the sisters did, in fact, take pride in their careers. They sometimes changed jobs working at various businesses in Helena, usually in secretarial or bookkeeping positions. Jenny worked for the IRS. Until 1935, the Lees occupied the brick building at the west end of State Street. 
in October 1935, an earthquake struck. And once again, the fabulous Lee sisters did something remarkable. An item in the Billings Gazette in November that year noted that what was believed to be the first settlement on an earthquake insurance policy in Helena was made to Ruby Lee. Attributing her purchase of the policy to a hunch after a minor quake on October 12, Ruby purchased a policy. And when the major earthquakes came later that month, her father's building was so badly damaged it was condemned. The Lees packed and moved on up to the west side. With the insurance money, they purchased a fine big home at 421 Power Street with a yard large enough for a garden. By 1940, the Lees occupying the house on Power Street included Mother Helen, Lillian, Jenny, Ruby, and Maybell. Ruby was the only one in the household working when the census was taken that year. Interestingly, by the time of this census, the women who had previously been identified as Chinese now all identified as white. Maybell, almost 20 years younger than the youngest Lee, was growing up. She attended St. Helena School, graduating from the eighth grade in 1932. She was very short, maybe about four feet six inches tall as an adult, with legs that were extremely bowed. She said that as a child, her foster mother had tied her in a high chair, and that caused her legs to develop crookedly. A nurse who saw photographs of Maybell said the twisting of her legs was caused by rickets, a vitamin D and calcium deficiency. If she'd been tied in a high chair, it was probably to protect the softened bones from further damage. Cared for by a family of women, Maybell was cheerful and pleasant. She played piano and appeared in several recitals in Helena. She worked as a clerk at the Veterans Administration, where she met and married Vern Peronto in 1959. They worked together selling CB radios and shared many hobbies. She died in 1994. The fabulous Lee sisters were remarkable in their determination to have careers, to be accepted in a place that wasn't always accepting. Ruby even joined the sons and daughters of the Montana pioneers, <laughs> indicating Sam F. Lee had been in Montana since 1864. Before Helen died in 1963, she gave her all-American daughters something of their Chinese heritage, something to remind them of their unity, even as they were separate. Jade is believed to possess magical qualities and powers. It is a symbol of protection and great virtue. Jade signifies peace through strength. For Chinese people, jade is the jewel that bridges heaven and earth. Helen Lee had one beautiful, good green jade bracelet and four daughters. With four sure strokes of a hammer, her bracelet became four pieces of jade. As each of the fabulous Lee sisters died, the four pieces came together again. Thank you.